Yeah, so uh, Long Gone is a... Oh, what is it? It's an adventure game, is the best way to describe it. But it's not an action adventure game, like you would think of like God of War and things like that, right? It's 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 an old school adventure game. So think of things like Monkey Island and you know Broken Sword, like th- those sorts of things. That's really good. I can see a lot of changes actually. I can see I can see a skeleton in the car. I can see yep. in the background there's some like new signage and things. So all of the main stuff is done. It's just about now getting it to the point where people can actually play it and understand that, you know, so they can get a sense of what the game not only is, but more importantly, what it isn't. Reach out if you are an indie game dev that has either released or is making a game and you can show things. Hello. Welcome to the Polygon Forest podcast. Uh, I am Chris Jarvis, indie game developer. Joined with me as ever is indie game developer Vin Hill. And hello. Hello. And today we're going to do something a bit different. So Polygon Forest podcast used to be like news, a little bit of indie games, because during the podcast we both started making indie games and being full-time game devs. Um we're going to change things up to the podcast and we're going to try and make it more about our jobs. We want to interview people like us, um, find out about their games, um, meet some new people and learn some best practice. That's kind of what we want to do with this. So, Yeah, it's, it's just about giving it fresh life because I think we've been teetering on the edge of you know wanting to talk about indie games a lot more. And when we did first start, you're right. Like I was a concept artist. You were working at some random company. You weren't working as a developer. But over time, that has completely changed. And now we just both coincidentally work as indie developers, like on professionally and in our spare time as well. So it just makes sense for the conversation to sort of lean a bit more towards that. Yeah. And so, yeah. I know like we've got a bit of an audience already from Polygon Forest, like there's 500 subscribers, which, you know, it's not nothing. awesome. Like we yeah. really appreciate it. Like it's great. Uh, but like if this isn't your jam then this is sort of like the hard line sort of explain to you that you know stuff is changing but if you are interested in indie development then absolutely stick around and if you enjoyed those little conversations that we used to have between the between the news um stuff then you know like uh, you're in for a treat because the podcast is going to lean a lot more towards that now yeah so yeah I'm excited it should be good it's gonna be good and this week we're going to talk about Vin's game Long Gone uh, so Vin, you're making an indie game and it's called Long Gone. Can you give yes. us an overview of what is Long Gone? Yeah, so uh, Long Gone is a, oh, what is it? It's an adventure game is the best way to describe it. But it's not an action adventure game like you would think of like God of War and things like that, right? It's 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 an old school adventure game. So think of things like Monkey Island and you know, broken sword, like th- those sorts of things. But it's an it, it has got some action in it. It's got a bit more engagement than that because it's it it's more of an adventure game, like uh, akin to uh, another world or out of this world, depending on how you pronounce it from whichever country you're from, because they have different titles. Huh. Or um, Flash, what is it? I can't remember the name of it. But yeah, it's. Another World is is the best example. Like that's that's the sort of game that I want to make. Um, it's a narrative driven um, adventure game set in a post apocalyptic landscape. Uh, you play as this uh, character, which is just a survivor. Um, he's kind of nameless. He he's a very tropey sort of character, which that's sort of done on purpose. Like he's he's got the jeans and the flannel, you know, and the and the the rugged look about him. And he's just going through these houses, and he's basically exploring houses in this neighborhood through the belongings that have sort of been left behind by these people, hence the name Long Gone. It's about the people that are no longer there. Um, and you're sort of discovering these people as you're sort of going through. You just sift them through their crap, basically, is the best way to describe it. Uh, but as you do it, like this this sort of, this greater narrative and this story unfolds around this neighborhood, around the families that live there, and you sort of get a good understanding about who they are by the end of the game. But it's also lots of humor mixed in, you know. It's it's got this cool sort of three point five D pixel art, low poly um, uh, art aesthetic to it, and yeah, I'm just having a ton of fun with the humor around it more than anything. So it's got serious conversations around it, but it's 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 juxtaposed 
the juxtaposition of the 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 actual present day stuff like the the original stuff like all of the stuff which you'll find in it can be seen like quite dark and depressing but like all the stuff in modern day is quite humorous you know like how the the character has got running commentary on like how post-apocalyptic games are usually they're very very tropey and he he makes light of that fact and it's very much a social commentary on where we are with um, post-apocalyptic video games and how they are we're basically just making the same thing over and over again like that's that's sort of the joke but there's yeah there's there's a lot of layers to it i'm having a bunch of fun with it um and hopefully people find that interesting so there's some jokes in there and some puzzles in there and like character pieces where you're learning about these families by sifting through their stuff and finding out more about the people that are gone exactly yeah so like a lot of that is done through items that you find and there are puzzles in the game so like the first puzzle that you come across which has sort of been shown quite publicly at this point which is you're you're this survivor that breaks into this front yard and you've got to try and figure out a way to get into the house and there's there's multiple different ways that you can sort of try and do it and you can fail a lot of different ways as well i'm having a lot of fun with like how you can fail a puzzle um with the the, the infamous uh, zombie McBite face that is just constantly like trying to chew off your face. For yeah, good reason because he's a zombie. That's what zombies do. And yeah, so there's that puzzle, but like throughout the items, like the items that you find in the world, sort of give this context to everything. Um, so you're able to interact with them. You can sort of inspect them and sort of pick them up and you know put them into your backpack and all that sort of stuff. So, but yeah, so a lot of environmental puzzles, which I I love them sort of games. So like even though they're quite tropey and people can find them quite boring. Um, I I love that stuff. I love just digging through stuff and, and having fun. Like people always reference The Last of Us um, with these sorts of games. Mm. And the thing that I used to get frustrated about with with The Last of Us, like you you'd see a you'd see a neighborhood, you walk into the neighborhood, you go into a house, and it was it was just empty. You know, like there wasn't really anything there. It was just oh, the same picture frames are on the walls, the same books are on the bookshelf. You know, it's just it's just set dressing. Like there's not actually anything to do there. Mm. So I wanted to make a game that was a bit more sort of in depth with that. You know, so you're actually as you're going through these houses, it's like oh, people actually used to live here, and just that mindset that Bethesda have got in their games, right? Like you you come across a skeleton in a bathroom and there's a note with it, right? And it's and then you read the note and it just gives this story to it. And you're like, oh wow, like there's it's not just a skeleton, which they could have just dumped there and like not left anything there, but someone went in there and gave it a love and care to, you know, give it that little bit more detail. Hmm. And I kind of want to explore a whole game of that, basically. So there's a bit more world building involved than in Naughty Dog, a bit more towards the, the fallout side of Yeah, I mean I'm not gonna like I'm not gonna say like my game's gonna game. be better world building <laughs> right than, than Naughty Dog games. But yeah, I mean that that's the goal is to sort of give this this lived in world like actually give it a bit of a soul you know like it's not just an environment that you're running through to to kill the next zombie like the game like the game that i'm working on long gone is not a survival game in any way and a lot of people have made that assumption when they see it they automatically assume like oh you collect all the bullets and you make all the food and you gotta you know survive day and night and stuff and it's a really dreary a story about death and life and mm. stuff like that and it's like that's that's not the game man whatsoever it's just it's not even teetering on that and I, i'm and i'm seeing glimpses of that come through now like people are starting to see what the game is and they're the people that are getting excited like oh i can't wait to play this it reminds me of monkey island mm. or like it reminds me of the adventure games when i used to play when i was a kid mm. and i i always, like whenever someone messages me that on tiktok or something like they're, they're the people i reply to i'm like Yes. you are my people that's like, the one yes yeah. that's yes you are that's it i like the corny so, the, yeah. the glimpses are coming through the corny comedy like monkey island comedy and like the because that was like leaning really into like the pirate tropes and this i guess is similar right. leaning into like the zombie tropes i suppose and making comedy out that's of that. that's exactly what it is yeah so it's it's that and 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 all adventure games sort of do this in a way um so like if you if you play games like beneath the uh, steel sky which is done by uh, Revolution Software, people that made Broken Sword. It's very much a trope of like the Blade Runner series, right? And like they're making fun of like sci-fi games. And then Broken Sword is this, this it's making fun of like detective games. And then you get Monkey Island, which is making fun of treasure, like and, and the pirates and all that sort of stuff. And it's just constantly making fun of it. It's not mocking it. It's just, it's having fun within that space. Yeah. Like, okay, how, how can we make people smile? I've played a lot of these types of games. I've read a lot of these types of books you know 
because I think the post-apocalyptic genre is just it's it's primed for that you know what i mean like it really needs just people to like point out yeah it just it like because it is tropey as hell and people should laugh at it you know like the first time that my dude dies in the game like that you can die sorry as a part of the puzzle um like the first thing that he says is like you, you can't you can't eat me zombie like ca- can't you see i'm wearing a pair of jeans and a flannel shirt that yeah. means i'm important yeah. And it's like, yes, like that's that's exactly the sort of thing that I'm going for constantly throughout the whole game. Yeah, the self awareness um, of it. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to be self aware, but it's that's a balance, right? Because you can get to, you can go too far mm. into that to the point that it's a bit like ah, it's trying too hard, you know. So that's going to take time with the writing, but I think I'm on to I'm on the right track, I think at least to be able to set that up to to find those mistakes as I come come across them. Cool. So I think now's a good time if we have a look at the game, see what it looks like. Okay. Yeah. So this is what it looks like at the moment. And it's this infamous, well, to me, it's infamous. A lot of people were probably <laughs> watching this. It'll be new. But you've been working on this for how long now? Uh, it's been about a year and a half, I'd say. Um, it but really? it hasn't been the whole time. Yeah. I mean, because the thing, I haven't really been working on it a lot over the past sort of eight months, just purely because like personal stuff in terms of like i've been immigrating moving between different countries i've only just arrived in the united states where i'm now living full time but before that i was sort of living out of a suitcase and just working off a laptop so i didn't really have the means to be fully focused on this but now that i'm a little bit more settled like i can get back to work and i've actually been working on it this weekend which has been a huge relief just to get back to making artwork again because i've been working on a lot of writing stuff but you know that's really good. I can see a lot of changes actually. I can see I can see a skeleton in the car. I can see yep. in the background there's some like new signage and things. And the yeah, so there was a lot. Well. There was a lot of new um, background art assets which I worked on. I've not really touched like the foreground stuff. Well, I have a little bit. I've I've, I've made this vine kit, so it's got like all these grassy bits all over the fence now. I can sort of show that in uh, action here, I believe. If I can scene, yeah, there we go. I can. Yeah, so the the vine kits are, it's it. I, I made like thirty different bushes, basically, just mm-hmm. corner bits and you know hangy little bits that are hanging off the edges and, and stuff like that, you know. Mm. And I'm able to just go in there and scatter these around and really have fun with these because um, these. Like when you make stuff like this, like this can really go anywhere in the game. So like this will be a perpetual thing. Yeah, it'll be indoors, um, right? It's not just gonna be outdoor stuff. Yeah, exactly. Because it's a post-apocalyptic game, right? So mm. there'll be like windows and stuff with with vines coming in and and just moss and things like that, which is really cool. Uh, but yeah, all the background has been updated as well. So we got the cars, as you've already mentioned. Uh, there's definitely like a like a, like a truck postal thing. van. Yeah. Uh, an old ambulance and in this view like it looks awful right yeah <laughs> like it's it looks well, it doesn't terrible. look awful it just looks it perspective you can see yeah it's out of context yeah. right but with this uh like i made a video about like how i'm working with parallax and stuff and sort of playing with that because originally i just had all of the houses just flat um as a single sort of plane in the background and it just looked flat like it looked awful um and my original intent was to just make it 3d um, but it takes a lot of work to make low poly 3D work because like just trying to get all the pixel sizes completely right, like with the fence mm. and stuff. Like all these pixels, like when you're when you're stood next to it as a character, like the pixels on that fence it, when next to a character is like they're all the exact same. So the only time that that pixel is ever like a different size to the character is when the character is close to the screen. Mm. So everything's consistent. So you sort of have a good understanding. And that's something that I can't play with because if uh, if I make pixels bigger in the background, then the player sort of loses sight of like how far away from the camera they are. Right. So, so actually have ground the character in the world. Exactly. So like I, I sort of need to stay consistent because of that stuff and it's it's very annoying. But at the same time, like it works out quite well. Um, but it's just about getting pixel art to work on three D objects is it's not an easy task which i can go into in a bit yeah but yeah that's the reason why i didn't want to make uh, these buildings 3d so i ended up just splitting them up 
and adding this sort of gap between them so it's got this parallax effect to it and so, so now when he yeah when he walks left and right you can actually see it sort of shift a little bit in the background so the front is moving at a different rate to the background which is stationary to give that false impression of yep. a three-dimensional object yeah and then you add effects to it like i've, I've got noise effects and you know like a, a nice blur effect in the background and stuff and once you add all this together and it sort of just looks consistent all the way through mm. and you don't have to you know you don't have to worry about it too much after that because it just it does the job it fits mm. i think it's great and the clouds moving behind as well and uh yeah you've got some mechanics that are working as well in the game haven't you yeah yeah so there's like bite face is obviously the big one um like people have probably seen him the most yeah uh, but if, you, if you've never seen this game this is like the first time you've seen it but yeah the the whole idea is is you go, you go through the scene and you're trying to like find objects and there's like there's these little points and stuff which you can inspect and sort of see hmm. what these things are um and then once you've inspected it, then it sort of shows up as as a thing. So it's sort of like that's been checked off. If you if you want to look, because there's going to be so many objects in the game, not so much in the yard, but in the within the houses, like you're going to be able to pick up pretty much anything or inspect anything that's in mm. the house. So you can imagine like how how crazy like it's going to get. Like uh, there's just going to be dots all over the place. But just this thing at the bottom changing every five seconds is going to get really annoying. Mm. That's my assumption anyway. That's why I've made it so there's this inspectable state you have to actually look at something before it becomes inspectable so bite face is the um it's the clear one yeah which he makes a joke out of it i should yeah. call him zombie my bite face and then the the title comes up at the bottom so now he's just so now he's known as zombie my bite face when you get to yes that. exactly oh that's good like, I need, I need to I need to do one for Bones Malone over here like because that's that's his nickname like in engine as well like, oh. I think, I think, uh, it's but I think that'll be a good sort of name to sort of give him as well. I'm pretty sure he's called Bones Malone. So does he? Oh. Does the character name the yes. name them then like all the all the zombies? Yeah, I kind of like I just like that idea. That it's this because if you've grown up in this world, right? Like it's not this isn't new. He's not a quote unquote survivor anymore. Like this is yeah, just his world. It's just his life. Yeah. Yeah. So he would make light of it. You know, what mm, I mean? like yeah. he would like out of boredom just like okay your name is blah 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 and he's just like going through and just naming all the dead people because he's got nothing better to do yeah. sort of thing yeah and i, I kind of like that idea you know this juxtaposition because it's super dark right yeah. like there's zombie mcbite face like that's a that was a human like someone you know someone that was, died that was a person that was alive turned into a zombie. Yeah. yeah but my dude's just like yeah zombie mcbite face sort of thing and it's like while it is quite funny like that's that's sort of what I'm going for more than anything is to start juxtaposition, you know. And so can you explain what, why have you been working on the yard and nothing else for like a year and a half? What's the purpose of that? Yeah. I mean, other stuff has been getting worked on as well. Um, but the main, the main way that you go through making a game, um, you make something called a vertical slice first. Um, it's just something that games developers do. And it's something that we don't really describe enough to what you call it to uh, to gamers that are yeah. sort of looking at this because they sort yeah. of think oh this is the only thing that you've been working on it's like this is not the only thing i've been working on um whatsoever like there's there's a whole sort of world that i need to sort of fill out which i can show bits of like the, all these houses i've got stuff in and i can make all the mechanics within these houses um but it looks crap right it's all just gray boxes like nothing Nothing is fun about this. UV, like, the default looks like material, but it looks a bit or like material one or something. Oh yeah, that's that's not like yeah. I mean, this is the vine kit, right? Oh, so okay, yeah. you can get a good sense of that. Then uh, they're all just planes, right? But that's cool. they all have to be consistent. Like at the moment, I'm I'm UV and this damn thing, and it's just it's driving me insane because like all these pixels have to be absolutely perfect to the player size. Hmm and getting them all the right way and and making sure that like i've got this grid and each one of these squares on the grid is a pixel and making sure all the uvs are the exact same size as that it's ooh, it's painful it's not fun whatsoever like people that like doing this they are called psychopaths because I, I don't know how they do it but yeah anyway i digress so <laughs> the game the game is getting worked on outside of uh, that stuff so i can sort of show this actually so we've got uh, there's there's different areas in the game Ooh. like that you can go and play. So it's supposed um, to happen is, with the things falling down. 
yeah, this is just like my this this is what the game looks like for the most part. Okay. Right. So like when I'm making the game, this is this is That's what it you looks see. crap. Right. There's no there's no walls, you know. Like I'm not really thinking about like how the game looks yet. I'm just I'm trying to get it functionally working. Yeah. That's it. That's the only thing I care about. Um and it's about getting that done so it you know, I can actually like figure stuff out and really think about you know how the how the game's actually going to play and stuff. Hmm. Um, so the game has been getting worked on. Like that's that's not really the problem. It's just like the only part that I've made look pretty is the the front yard, and the whole purpose for that is to sort of generate a way to uh, use that in marketing, right? So then I can sort of show that off to the world while I'm working on the rest of the game. Hmm. Because if I if I slowly built up the game consistently to look pretty throughout the whole thing. You know, I wouldn't be able to show anything off until the game is almost finished, mm. which is that's absolutely a tactic that you could go for. And there's a lot of companies that do do that. Mm. But mm. I'm a solo developer and I need to sort of get wishlist generating as early as possible. So while the game looks like this and it looks like crap, you know, it it looks fine. Uh, like I, I can work within this space. But for the most part, like people want to see the pretty polished stuff, which is the, you know, like we want. The, the the pretty front yard and stuff and we don't want to see like this this gray box that isn't you know doesn't look pretty yet like yeah they want, they want to see the grass they want to see you know they want to see the cars in the background they want to see like they want to see a product mm. right so that's the main reason why um why it's been worked that way and also like you you want it you don't want to show everything at once that's another thing yeah as well like there's plenty there's a lot of the game which I just haven't shown, like even within this space in, in the beginning bit, like I haven't shown certain animations. I haven't shown uh, certain use cases of the player and what they can go through because I don't want to ruin it, right? Because if I do release this as a demo at some point, which I do plan to do, mm. like I, I, I would like to create a demo for, you know, like get out of the get out of the front yard demo or something, you know, like so people can play it and sort of get a sense of it and really understand what the game is. Yeah. Um, and when that time comes, I also don't want to ruin it. So like, yeah. there's plenty of stuff even within the front yard that people haven't seen. And I've been really tempted. I've been close to show that stuff. It's like, no, I'm going. I need to hold off because you know, people like I, I want them. I want them moments so that people are actually playing the game for the first time to be like, oh, that's dope. You know, like yeah. I, I didn't see that coming or you know whatever. So it's just it's it's about setting expectations and, and really doing things in the right order because. First you make a first you make a prototype, then you make a vertical slice, which is like all the polished stuff to sort of get all of the, the art pipeline set up. And then once that's done, which I'm past that, you then go into production, which is just you gray box the entire game, which is what I'm doing at the moment. <laughs> so nothing looks pretty. But yeah. I've sort of I've sort of used that test bed in this area and said, you know what, this is totally doable. Like all of the artwork pipeline is sort of set up. I know how all that's gonna look. And now I'm just working on the full game and that's just getting done in the background. Mm. However, I am sort of going back and forth to this bit yeah. because like I said, I do want to release this as a demo at some point. And that's why this has started to get a bit more pretty over the past sort of um, couple of months because I've been like, okay, it's time to, now like the core mechanics are in, like I've got, you know, like him talking and stuff like that. And that's all systemic as well. Like if I just type, if, if I just put stuff into the script, he, his mouth moves yeah. to the script. I, I'm not programming any of that anymore. Like it's all systemic, which is great. Like all the dialogue's done, you know, like my inventory system is, is all finished and stuff. Hmm. So I can like go into my bag and, uh, you know, go through it and things like that. Um, so all of the main stuff is done. It's just about now getting it to the point where people can actually play it and understand that, you know so they can get a sense of what the game not only is but more importantly what it isn't because mm. like i was mentioning before there's so many people out there that just think that this game is a survival game that's all you do where you have to collect water and food and medicine and yeah yeah weapons and i play with that i play with that trope a lot like there's like the for it's sort of spoiler alert here but like there's there's bullets in the game there's guns in the game and stuff but it's not a yeah shooting there, game. there's yeah, people are going to be walking around with bullets in their bag for a while before they realize, like, I actually don't need this stuff, <laughs> you know? Like, and I, and I want that moment. I really do. Like, I'm looking forward to watching a stream where people haven't watched this video, no idea about this game. They just download it and play it, and they're walking around with just, like, a bag full of bullets. Yeah. Like, why, like, why is there no guns in this game? It's like, yeah, there's a good reason for that. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the joke. You just, you're just hoarding bullets because that's what your brain's conditioned to do. Yeah. Um, so I, can't, I want to play with that as much as I can. 
Yeah, know? or like, oh, there's a load of bullets here. I definitely am going to go into a boss fight. Or right. like there's and a there's just nothing. Yeah, and then there's just like <laughs> nothing. Or like more, oh, learn about this family more, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I, I love that stuff. I think it's great, you know. Like, I really want to play with that as much as possible. And just being able to um, play with, like, subvert people's expectations as mm. much as I can. Uh, I don't want to do that too much. Like, you obviously want to reward that because you want to make people feel intelligent. Hmm. But there's going to be times where I do want to, you know, sort of mess with that a little bit. And they're not just, you know, it's just not the normal stuff all the time. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. I like those fail states as well that you've spent a lot of time on. A lot of the time you have these games, especially in that era of, like, Monkey Island, where you, you not specifically Monkey Island, but that sort of era, you might have, like, you know, the screen would go black and it would be like, you know, your journey is ended or game over or whatever. But mm. you've spent some time making common, cool and thoughtful end states because it's a time that the player spends a lot of time in, you know, uh, yeah. times when the, when the player And, and I want, I want the them thing. to experiment. Yeah, the main reason why that came about, honestly, is that I want people to experiment, but I don't want that experimentation to become frustrating. Um, there's, I think we we... I've fallen into this weird sort of uh, pit in the games industry at the moment where it's like, okay, if you fail to do the thing that you want the player to do, like it automatically means like, okay, you messed up mm. sort of thing. And it's a weird, it's a weird thing to sort of contend with. It's like, why not reward them for failing? Mm. You know? And that's that's sort of what the the idea behind the animations are and stuff. Like it's it's that idea of you know like you can fail like you can try multiple different things with this guy and he's just going to e keep eating your face off and he's like okay that didn't work but at least you get a funny animation out of it and mm. it doesn't feel like a failure it's sort of it's an acknowledgement for me as the developer to sort of say okay player i see what you tried to do there and it was a good idea mm. but it was the wrong idea yeah you know like and it's a, a subliminal message versus you know just that was wrong you know and i do have i do have cases with that where i can you know i can try and use certain objects on certain things so if i pick up his this bullet here and try and use that on um something else like he will have moments where he just shrugs it off and he doesn't yeah. know what to do with it yeah right like the, that's the wrong thing like they're the overt ones which is just yeah obviously you can't just throw a rusted bullet at a, at at a door. door plank and it's going to work you know yeah. like i'm not going to have a funny case for that because there's so many items in the game you can't have it for, but for the things yeah. But for the things that are obvious, like that could work, you know, I absolutely want to try and catch all of those use cases if I can, mm. you know, like if you do try and use a potato pe peeler on, um, on zombie make by face, what would happen? You know, yeah. like I, I want to see it? that. I don't. Yeah. Right. Would you try and be like, okay, I'm going to go at this guy yeah. with his hair or whatever. Like, or, you know, am I just going to shrug it off and be like, no, you can't do that. It's like, yeah, but you could try and stab him with it or you could do something with, you know, yeah. like if there's, if there's an obvious sort of solution there that could work, quote unquote could. Yeah. Why not? Why not play with that? And it's sort of like, that's the high, the whole idea behind, you know, or like a pun. Um, this isn't very, fail states. this isn't very appealing to me. Right. Yeah. Stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's, there's a bunch of those and I want to play with that as much as possible. And it's a lot of work, you know, like the animations and stuff. Like you have to constantly, like every time something different happens in the game, I've got to make an animation for that. And it's not yeah. just like 3D animation. It's pixel art. It's keyframe. I have to draw frame by frame each one of these things. But when it's done and it's done right, it just it looks great. Like even Zombie McBrayface, like he's got he's got a few different states. He's got like this crazy, like when I'm next to him. Mm. And then he's got like this other state, which I'm a bit further away from him. He's still a bit agitated. Like he can see me, but I'm not quite close enough for him to like start shouting at me. Yeah. But then when I'm further away, like he's, he's, he's kind of calm and just yeah. settled. Yeah. So like even having those like separate things, That's... like they're really subtle, you know, yeah. <laughs> but it adds so much life to it. Yeah. And it's just like, okay, what any other game, like if, if this was like this, there'll be another fence like between you and Zombie McBiface, I'll be an object where you can't like physically get close to him, you know, and because they want to gate that off. But I, yeah, no, screw it. Like, why not be able to just walk into walk him and into see what it happens? And get you know, eaten. yeah, and it's just like and do sure. it over and over again as long as you want. Yeah, to. yeah, and I, I go nuts with it. You know what I mean? Yeah, and that's that's the best thing about it. And he just like the the player just keeps complaining about it or whatever. Um, but yeah, I love that sort of stuff. And I think it's really, really clever the way you can play with that sort of stuff. Yeah. It means we're important. 
<laughs> but yeah, if you do fail a couple of times, if you do like go through a couple of fail states and the player will give you a hint. That's, yeah. that's one system I did set up. So it sort of makes it that it doesn't get frustrating at any point. Um, but I don't, because I, I hate games where you walk into an area and you instantly get the hint. Yeah, it drives I hate me that. Insane. Yeah, I hate that. When it, when it was like, oh, you're in a new area. Oh, what about that door over there? It's like, just, why am I playing this game? Mm. Like, why? You're like, this isn't the game me. anymore. The game plays itself. Yeah. 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 It's just a visual novel now. I don't I don't like this. I don't want to play it. Um, but it's just about giving them that bone when they need it. You mm. know, yeah. so if they fail a couple of times. If they try and open this door, um, like this door a couple of times and they've failed then it's gonna give you this hint it's like oh maybe i should try and pry these off the door somehow like after a couple of times mm. of trying so it isn't just you getting frustrated and just, oh it's giving me a hint there okay mm. like and it's a hint that you actually need if you've tried that thing twice yeah so it's cause and effect hints more than anything um but yeah i'm just i'm just trying to like treat the player like they're adults rather than you know yeah. like babies because it drives me insane um so I've noticed, uh, and the audience has probably noticed, that you've, in the top left-hand corner, it says Unity. So you're making this game in Unity. Oh, God. Here we go. So there's that question. <laughs> there's that question in the news. I don't know if anyone's familiar, yeah. but Unity changed their pricing model, which is going to hurt uh, a lot of smaller indie studios. Um, and you're still making Long Gone in Unity. Um, yeah. So, so when you started it a year and a half ago, there was no problem in using Unity. So now there's this, I guess it's a little bit of an elephant. I don't know if you had any thoughts on Unity. It's tough because like when it, when it happened, it was sort of, there was so much of an outcry that, I mean, I called it straight away. I, I mean, we had conversations about it and I knew that the, the choices that they made were incredibly stupid and that they would get reversed and they did like pretty quickly. Mm. Um, there's still some changes there, which are a bit more questionable, but still it's it's a lot more clear now and if they came out the gate with this new model that they come out with then it'd probably be a lot less of an issue yeah um but that being said it did shake um the community a little bit yeah right? like confidence it's, it's this knocked. idea of right it's it's less about like what is happening right now and what the changes actually are anymore it's more about okay but what happens in six months time when they do something else and they fumble it like they fumbled this and it, it all comes on that confidence hit um, there is there's two sides of this which you could sort of look at it from you could say well you know they they probably learned their lesson from this and this probably isn't going to happen again that's that's what we would all like to believe um, but then there's the cynical side of you which is like well you know i should probably start looking at different game engines now because like this is this is pretty rough mm. but i mean for me personally though it's it's one of those situations where i don't really have a choice but continue with the game in the engine that i've got at the moment because i'm so far into it that the idea of stopping what I'm doing and switching to another engine and rebuilding the entire game in a different engine like that just yeah that just gives me heart palpitations just thinking about it yeah you know so it's not a quick but, thing for anyone that doesn't know you can't just switch engines no uh, halfway yeah. through production of a a video game it's yeah. but saying that I mean the next the next game like will will I start looking at other options probably yeah I I mean I'm I'm always open to like look around. Um, but at the end of the day, I think what Unity is trying to do, if you sort of take a step back and look at what they've been trying to achieve over the past few years in particular, um, they've they've been constantly stuck in this sort of indie um, community mindset, which is, you know, like make small little pixel art games or like low poly 3D games like for, for, your, for your mobile devices. That's sort of what their engine has always been. Mm. And they've made a very, very conscious shift over the past few years. They, they bought Weta Workshop which is the, the folks that do all the visual effects for uh, Lord of the Rings and Avatar and stuff like that. Uh, and they also released um, HRDP, which is uh, HD... HDRP or H... HDRP, HRP. sorry, yeah. I'm getting all my... <laughs> getting all the letters mixed up. But yeah, so they released that and then they released a demo called the uh, the Adam Project, which is like this robot, like and they're trying to go after the AAA whales now, basically. Yeah. Like that's the mindset that they're sort of going for. And everything that they've been doing is sort of pushing towards that. And that's what this decision was sort of circling around. They didn't look at the indies when they were making this decision. No. It was very, very obvious. They were just looking at the, the AAA whales. Like, you know what? We really want to get away from the Indies because they don't make us enough money. Like yeah. the AAA scene. And, like. yeah, there's... and it's and it's fair. Like they're, 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 they're a business at the end of the day. Uh, but at the same time, like that, 
was probably one of the biggest PR blunders I've seen in a long, long time. Yeah. Um, definitely something they should have had like lengthier conversations about before they made those yeah. decisions. But they've had people w- uh, like walk out, um, and they've yeah. had a they've had people walk out and quit, and they've had a, was it a they've put swatted or a bomb threat or something, or they had to close one of the offices yeah. or something. So it's been a real bad time. Um, but yeah, so coming back to Long Gone then. Okay, so what else yeah. we talk about? So um, you're bootstrapping this then. This is just like your side project in your spare time, uh, just made by yourself from the ground up. Um, So are you, is that going to be indefinitely? Are you considering options? Like what's, what's on the cards for you regarding funding? Yeah, so far I've just been making a game by myself, um, which always surprises people. And it's like, uh, it's not a surprise because it's so impressive or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying. It's, it's, it surprises people purely because it's insane. Like <laughs> just yeah. the sheer amount of work that there is to do. And I, for what it's worth, I agree with them people. Yeah. Um, it is insane. Like it's absolutely ludicrous. Um, no, I mean, it's not always, it, it wouldn't be like if the situation came about where there was like, okay, the only choices for you then is to make this game by yourself. And so be it. You know what I mean? Like whatever. It's just, it's just going to take a little bit longer, but I'll get there. Like, it's fine. Like, I, I don't mind doing that because I'm sort of learning a lot as I go through. And, like, from animation to programming, like, I've, I've coded the whole game by myself. I do all of the, the effects, all of the artwork, like, everything. Like, marketing-wise, I'm doing all that by myself. Mm. Like, that's all sort of grassroots stuff. Um, so I'm learning a lot and having a great time doing it. It's just, like, the world gets a, the world get a point where... I will get to a point where my... Uh, my awaiting players will get impatient and that's that's the deal that we have to solve that's the reality that we have to solve yeah by. it's like do i choose to ignore the people that have wishlisted the game like the twenty thousand people that have gone ahead and done that which is awesome and great and i love that um do i ignore those folks and just like you know what i'm just going to make this game at my own pace it takes five years it takes five years or do i start looking at this as a business mindset and like okay should i find a publisher should I um, self-fund this game and, and hire a, a 3D artist or someone? Someone that can just come in and, you know, like UV unwrap all my stuff because, like, I really don't have time or the patience for that because it takes time. Like, that's the stuff that takes the most time is the artwork and just making it look pretty. Yeah. Uh, and it's also, like, the least... It, it's the thing that's solved the most as well, you know? Like, yeah. That's the worst part of all of this is it's that thing is it's doable like all of it's doable it's just it just takes time it just takes bodies so if i was to bring anyone on it would probably be to just help out with the art a little bit even just the technical side of it more than anything um but beyond that it's yeah i go back and forth on the whole idea of should i get published should i self-fund should i just make the game by myself like those three options like i jump between those on a daily basis sometimes i'm like you know what it'd be awesome if i had a second person and there's other times like, you know what, like I really would like 100% of this game when it comes out. <laughs> and there's yeah. other times where, like, you know, the experience of working with a publisher might be really cool. And it just, it, all the time, I'm just constantly jumping between those things, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's tough because this game, this industry is really tough in, in terms of like how much money you can make and stuff. Uh, mm. Like my goal is to really get enough funding for the next game as well. Yeah. Because that's that's where you want to get to. I don't want to become like a multi millionaire. Like that's the likelihood of that happening is astronomically small. Yeah. But the idea is like, okay, make this by myself as much as I can, uh, save a, enough money for when the game comes out, and then when it does come out, I'll have enough money to fund the next thing yeah. by myself. Yeah. And then the thing after that, and then the thing after that, and then that now I've got a career now I've got a life yeah you know what I mean like this isn't I don't have to rely on anyone else it's just I'm just doing what I want to do and it's tricky because publishers could publishers have like connections to things which can increase the uh the wish lists right mm-hmm. so publishers can act like a, a multiplier and so there is like a there is a number there is an amount where if you made it by yourself and you could uh you know there is an unknown amount of marketing you could do by yourself. So there's like an unknown amount of total money you could get 100% by yourself. Yeah. If you've got a publisher, there's like a bottom floor and there's like a top floor that you know yeah. that it, they're going to get somewhere between this amount of wish lists. And then however much money they get, you know, you can do the calculations. So it's a, 
it's a numbers game. And then, yeah, you're right. You've said this before. Like, the more you make the game, the less of a percentage they they would take because the game is more finished yeah. and it's more of a sure thing as well. And so they're more likely to want to to go with you. So it's a real, yeah. Uh, it's tricky, isn't it? Because yeah, it's it's a weird sort of you have to do like mental um, basketball with yourself sort of thing because you're playing a game like a meta game, I should say, um, in your head where you're like, okay, if the game made this much, hmm. then you can make all the calculations based off that, right? Hmm. But ultimately, you don't know how much the game is going to make, so you're trying to play numbers game with something that you don't you, you haven't got the number yet. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you're not going to get that number until the game's out, and it's going to be too late by that point. Hmm. So it's it's all a massive gamble that you have to play with, and it's like, okay, what is the lowest denominator? Like, how how little could I make off this game? Yeah. Based on the wish list and the engagement that I'm getting, sort of thing, and then asking yourself, is working with someone else or bringing someone else in worth it at that point? And if the answer is still no, which it currently is, absolutely. Like I've I've got twenty thousand wish lists, which is awesome. It's amazing. Yeah. But when when the rubber hits the road like that actually converts to like everything that you read online about 40 percent of people actually convert from your wish list and then out of that 40 percent only like 10 percent buy it at full price on the day that it comes out yeah um so it's stuff like that that you've got to take into account so that twenty thousand like automatically just descends into like becoming about one thousand so then you're like okay what's a thousand times however uh, whatever price i'm putting at this game hmm. Is that return worth it? You know, like these are the sorts of weird numbers games that you have to go through mm. when you're sort of thinking about it. And there's the unknown and that's as well. A, that's just Steam. That's yeah, just Steam that's just as well. Steam. Yeah, and that's not with, yeah. with any other I've been, consoles. Like this week, this week I was contacted by uh, someone at Good Old Games, um, which is the CD Projekt Red publisher, um, and that's an invite-only store. And I find out from them, he was like, uh, like the the dude was talking to me. He was like, oh, I sent you along like an agreement that you can sign, sort of thing. And I haven't signed it yet. Um, so I can talk about it, but in the, in the agreement, it's like good old games get 70% of the game, 70 and you get 30 bananas, right? Like that is astronomically large. And it's like, okay, but I wouldn't get They've any sales off that platform. On there, though. They've got some proper big games on there. Well, it's a curated marketplace, yeah. right? So like, it's, it's an absolute honor that he's messaged me and yeah. stuff, but 30, like 30% for the game that I've made, it's like, that is kind of low. You know what I mean? Like, that's a bit too low almost. Like, it was even 50-50, that would be a bit closer to it. Yeah. But it's still like, yeah, I mean, like, if, if I'm put onto the, that game store and it's like I'm sat next to games like Monkey Island, I'm sat next to games like Broken Sword and stuff like that, which is amazing, you know? Like, it's a great platform to be on, but that's that's again playing that numbers game like if the game only sells this much and i'm only making that much back like is is this you know like you've got it this is the sort of stuff that you juggle around your head a lot you yeah know? like you've got to um because it's just unfortunately it's just the state of the industry that we're in it's like the standard is 30 to 70 percent of your game just automatically gets cut out from under you yeah from the distributors on the store that you put on yeah and that's just digital well, steam right? steam takes their 30 is it 33 or 30 percent they take 30. 30. Um, I think PlayStation and Xbox are 30 as well. Mm. I think I think Nintendo are a little bit higher. Um, I can't remember though. Mm. Um, but yeah, they're all they're all very different. But I mean, there's other industries. Like my wife, she works in um, she works for like on a crafting website, uh, Etsy. And there was a big uproar a few years ago because they changed the base amount that they get from like I think it was like four to seven percent or something. There was an uproar that you know Etsy were taking seven percent of their products, and it was like, I only seven. <laughs> you know I mean? like yeah. yeah, and I'm just sat there like, what, like seven, <laughs> like what, like seven, not seven zero, not seven, seven zero, you know, seven. <laughs> yeah. And I'm over here talking to good old games, and they're like, yeah, we take seventy percent of your game. It's like this is it's it, but that's that's the state of the games industry because we haven't really made enough stink about that yet. Yeah, um, and there's just people like cutting out from under the top, and, we, and that's why we got to play these games. Yeah, that's the difference between it me. Because seems... if because if it was seven percent, I'd be like, yeah, hell yeah, yeah I'm hiring oh, yeah. someone tomorrow. Yeah, no problem, you know. But like that's you know, we're we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars which could be taken out of my game, just because you know. But then you got to weigh it up with like, but if you didn't, what would you do? Exactly. Like you can't just yeah. 
like show pictures of your game around. It needs to be on some sort of platform. So yeah, I mean, this this is the power of Steam in particular. Mm. It's like when you get wish list. Like uh, generally, we don't care about wish lists as pre orders. Like that's not that's not what the benefit of wish lists are. The main benefit out of wish list that we always get is the uh, the assurance of where we're going to be put onto the store when the game is released. Yeah. Um, so if you've got a game that's got twenty to a hundred thousand wish lists, you're going to be on the front page when that game comes out, and millions of gamers are going to see that. Yeah. So it's exposure, like the, it's it's marketing in a, in a way. So we're not looking at wish lists as like how many people have pre-ordered the game. That's not like I have no assumptions about that because you have no idea because. I've seen horror stories of people that have gotten, you know, 50,000 wish lists and then the game comes out to crickets. Like nobody downloads it. Mm. Like nobody's bought it, even though they've been wish listed like hundreds of thousands of times. Um, we, we've all seen those horror stories, so we can't rely on can't that. Rely but what on we it. can rely on is the exposure which the game gets when it gets released. Yeah. And hope that it lands on a day where it doesn't conflict with something else and it just hits that golden window. Mm where it's like oh this game looks cool and people just click the button just out of you know impulse buy like that those are the people that we're after um for the majority and but that takes grassroots and building up wish list to get to that yeah yeah and that's something which um what how do you credit that what um went into helping you gain twenty thousand wish lists on steam what what sort of marketing beats happened for you to get that that success at this stage yeah there was a couple of things the main one was Oh, well, the first one was uh, Twitter. So I started out on there uh, just posting little bits of Zombie McBiteface. And as soon as I put him in, like people started noticing straight away. Like they saw the animation of him like trying to grab grab the player and stuff. And people were, were interested off that. And that made me a little bit nervous because I was kind of like, oh, it's, it's the only thing that people are like is that damn zombie <laughs> yeah. sort of thing. Because the rest of the game doesn't have that many zombies. In. Um, so like, that made me a little bit nervous. But that that changed like later on because i got i, th- I think the the biggest like viral point which i got on twitter was i think we got about six thousand likes a hundred thousand views or something on one of the videos that i posted and that really kick-started like everything uh into motion for that and i think i got about two thousand whistlers or something off the back of that mm. that first one that sort of kicked off and that was lucky because algorithms are just it's just you can't you, you can't predict them yeah you can't you can't control them you can't try and get ahead like there's people it's like oh if you post at three o'clock in the afternoon mm. on, in this time zone and you know and you and you put this at the beginning with this sort of text and you make sure that you put this in the in the tags and stuff it's like none of that matters I don't think like it's, it's any magic absolute bs formula it's just if it's a, no. if it's something that's pe- something that people will like if it's something yes. that people will like and it does well. If it's something it that people off. won't like, it. it doesn't do well. Yeah, and there's a whole like look factor to that as well. So like, I have not, I have posted things at random ass times in the day, hmm. like at one o'clock in the morning. That I've kicked off the next day. It's just because people just started liking it and just kicked off, and that was it. Hmm. Like, I, I generally don't believe that there is any magic sauce hmm. to going viral in any sort of sense. And I sort of learned most of that like off the next step, hmm. which was after Twitter. It was actually you that recommended me to get on TikTok. And uh, I was skeptical of it because there's a bunch of teenagers, teenagers and people dancing. eating Tide Pods. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and twerking and stuff. And it's just like, it's just a weird place, man. Like for a, like the elder millennials like us. Yeah. You know, like we're, we're just like, what is this? You know what I mean? This like, is just a weird my place. space page. <laughs> no. It's, yeah, right. Where's your favorite <laughs> Why I, uh, Right. Why can't I edit my music in the background? Where's the HTML code at? Um, yeah. <laughs> so, like, I got on that, and I, like, the first thing that I posted, it just, it went crazy. And w- making sort of comparisons to what I got on Twitter, which was, like, the 6,000 likes, mm. um, quickly got to 2 million views on one of the first things I posted. And that was, like, crap. Like that's stuff like, is, uh-oh. Th- this is serious now, right? Because yeah. before, like at that point, I mean, you know this because you were there. Um, I was on and off about the game. It was like, uh, should I like put all my effort into this? Should I like actually make this? Should this be the game that I want to put all my effort in over the next few years? Yeah. Like that question was still floating around in my head. And when stuff really started to kick off online and the wish list started rolling in, that was when I was a bit like, 
All right. Okay. I guess Gotta make this that, then. That, that sort of answers it. Yeah. I guess. Because you've posted yeah. like uh, characters and character controllers and um, models and, you know, bits and pieces of like personal projects over the years. And they just mm. hadn't had that 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 same amount of reaction. So how, how many... So was it the 20,000 wish lists you, you count towards like um, the 2 million views? Would you say 2 million views roughly for you translated to like... 18,000 wish lists and or like 15,000 wish lists. Yeah, it's weird because I've seen other projects do well and then also not do as well but get more wish lists out of it. It really it it's it's really inconsistent. There's no sort of magic formula to that. I can't say mm. that because I've I've gotten like overall I think I've gotten about 10 million views on TikTok altogether now, like across all my content. Mm. And then there's other people that have shared stuff and and like just reposted my videos elsewhere that I've gotten 5 million views or something. I've just had nothing to do with it. That happens a lot. But how much all of that contributes to like X amount of wish lists? I've no idea. I've not got a yeah. clue. Um, Cause it could cause be there's people that just, it could people that just 7, follow me as well on steam. And then after you got the 7,000 threshold on steam, it could just be steam uh, pushing up, pushing yeah. the rest. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's so convoluted and model up now that I couldn't be able to attribute like x amount of views to x amount of wish lists i just couldn't like mm. it's kind of impossible at this point and you sort of i i always have to take a step back as well because on tiktok in particular i've gotten twenty thousand wish lists on steam but i've gained fifty thousand followers on tiktok so it's like okay mm. maybe they just don't have steam maybe they're console players and maybe they're just following because they just like the look of the game and so, they'll, they'll buy it on xbox when it comes out so it's you know, thirty thousand just... people that haven't wish listed the game Maybe. And like maybe it's even less than that. Maybe it's only like ten thousand of them of my followers have actually wish listed the game. Mm. And there's forty thousand of them just floating around waiting for the console version to come out. Yeah. You know? Like that that could be a thing. So it's it's really hard to sort of translate that over um and really sort of look at it. Because there's other places where I just haven't had success, right? Like I've posted stuff on Instagram and stuff and like if I had a video like get to about 2000 views or something on uh instagram mm. threads is very similar to twitter um in more ways than one um youtube like stuff tanks are like nothing nothing really kicks off so it's like it's this. it's interesting yeah no i mean like for the game i mean yeah like, yeah but, yeah 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 i mean we've got 500, uh, 500 we've got 500 subscribers, subscribers. So scoff no yeah but like when we do videos about We've done videos and we've focused on, you know, the game before we talk right. about the game yeah, yeah. and it's been crickets. Crickets. Nobody watches it. Yeah. And it, it, it's very much a game suited for short form, I found. You know, people are scrolling through and they see funny gifs of, you know, pixels, zombie zombies, face they're like player or all over it. Yeah. I get yeah, that. that and, they, and they love that sort of stuff. But that is the concern, right? Because that's why I sort of keep all of this at arm's length as much as I can. Because is is my game just cool to look at? Or is it cool to play? Yeah, like that's that's the next big question, which I'm trying to answer with the demo, because mm. like right now it could just be yeah, it looks cool, but nobody's gonna play it. Like it might be the most streamable game in the world, but only twenty, like twenty people buy it and then they stream it and then millions of people watch it. You know, could that that could happen? Mm. Like because my game sort of falls into that quite well, mm. uh, in a bad way. Like does does that does that lead to sales? I don't know yet. So mm. we'll see. That's cool. Yeah. So, um, so that was TikTok, and uh, so that was TikTok that mainly did that, and a bit of Twitter. Um, it was mostly TikTok, though. It was mostly like TikTok. Yeah. Um. So, what else do you want to talk about with the game? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's just about what's next, which is the the demo is a new one. Um, it's just thinking about what next step i want to make because now that like as i sort of alluded to before i'm now in the united states i'm on solid ground now this is where i'm going to be staying for a while i need to set up a company llc i need to you know start thinking about should i maybe set up a patreon page or something for the people mm. that are really interested in development of the game mm. you know like these are the questions which i've got to start answering um so because we yeah, know the, that engagement that, drives your um like investment in the game as well like if more people are interested right. the more you work on the game right yeah exactly it's a it's sort of like this weird cycle that you get into because when people are excited about it you're, you're more you're more excited to, uh, to actually work on it as well 
um, granted, I'm quite like I've I'd like to think that I've got a good sort of work ethic around the game anyway, and I tend to like my Saturdays and some of my Sunday are usually like planted into the game anyway. But it's about should I should it bleed into my spare time throughout the week sort of thing? Mm. Like that's the real question now, and how serious is this actually going to get? Because if it starts looking like okay, this is not just about zombie McBite face, it's it's like people are actually wanting to play the game. Mm. And that that all gets answered from the demo, right? So like when the demo is out and people are playing it, if they are really like, I want to play more of this, like that's going to be like the true sort of test for me. Um, yeah. Because I'm still I'm still at that point where it could just fall flat on its face. It might just be a GIF game. You know what I mean? Like people just like the way that it looks, but when they're playing it, they might hate it. Um, so it's it's about figuring that out because if it is if that is the case where they're just like yeah it looks great but it plays awful like this is not my sort of game then I've really got to stand back and say okay should I change this so it does become a game that people want to play or do I carry on with, with what my like original vision was vision with it. yeah yeah and and know that people aren't going to play it you know what I mean because there's there's something to be said for that as well like I think that the most classic games that come out. Are made by people that have that mindset of just yeah, screw I'm gonna this. make the game. This is the game I want to make. make. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's tough. No, I enjoy it. I I I'm, I think that it, I think people are going to enjoy it. I think that it's it's quite rightly already got a following, and they can see what makes the game special already. I think. Um, so I think you're on something uh, special. Uh, you know, however well it does is not down to how good the game is unfortunately because that's the world we're living in yeah marketing marketing the sort of whole thing and you're just yeah. one person i mean we, i mean we barely we barely touched on that but like that's the main reason why i would want to work with a publisher more than anything it's got absolutely nothing to do with their help with development or distribution or anything like that it's mm. everything to do with marketing yeah everything yeah like it would all depend on their marketing power yeah not to... how many eyes they can get in front of right well Maybe we'll come back to this if we can't find anyone. Um, thank you f for sharing. Uh, please post any comments. Um, like and subscribe if you wanted to see more of this sort of stuff. Um, reach out if you are an indie game dev that has either released or is making a game and you can show things. Um, we understand that people that have got publishers they probably won't be able to show things or in development, but um, Finnish Games would like to get some people on that Finnish Games on to... to come and talk about the game uh i'll talk about my game at some point and yeah i'm making a game called focus find it's a 2d psychological sci-fi thriller uh we play a floating orb floating through the stages of grief you can wish this that on steam now that would be good if you want to support the channel that'd be one cool way of doing it as well and yeah i think that's it we're coming up to an hour do you have anything else you want to say before we wrap it up no, that's that's about it. I mean, if again, if you if you're interested in um, anything that you've seen today, then just go and search uh, at Hillfort Games for anything uh, or Long Gone Game. Like that's usually how you find it. Uh, you can wishlist that on Steam as well. But yeah, make sure you check out Focus Find for Chris's stuff, which we will be talking about at some point. If not, I'm sure. Rather than later. Yeah, I'm sure we will. I'm very sure. But, the, let's, but yeah, I mean yeah. that that being said, like when when it comes to um, anyone that's sort of interested in coming onto the show to talk about the games, big or small, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's not like we're really interested just having conversations with people in this pit and just sort of yeah. going through this process like we are. It doesn't matter how big or small the game is. Like we just we just want to have conversations with folks. Hmm. So yeah, if you if you feel like you've got something to show or like talk about, even if it's early or late, like let us know. Yep. Yep. Sounds good. Cool. All right, we'll leave it there then, and then we'll hopefully catch you next week then. Indeed, that we shall. Okay. Okay. Till next time. Bye bye. Oh wait. Oh, where can people find you? Oh, uh, Acrylic Pixel. So if you Google Acrylic Pixel, um, that's the company name, and Focus Find is the game. So if, you know. TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, all that jazz, LinkedIn. Awesome. All right. Until next time. Thank you very much. Catch you later. Ta-ta. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.